Good morning, and uh, I gather some folks out in the, in the province that I'm speaking to, so good morning to you also. As the topic um, I saw in the newspaper about a couple of weeks ago that the Canadian Preventive Services Task Force, or something similar to that name, has recently tied on and uh, basically uh, agreed and supported the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. So it's no longer just the U.S. that's standing out there. Uh, the Canadians have, and I figure I figured as a potential topic, I would review the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in some detail because it's gotten a lot of notoriety in the U.S., a lot of bashing uh, by urologists in the U.S., and I thought, let's look at the data critically together and see what they said and see if it's as unreasonable as most urologists say it is. So let's start. It's been published, Annals of Internal Medicine, if you care to read it. The controversy stems on that final recommendation. The U.S. Preventive Service recommends against PSA-based screening for prostate cancer, grade D recommendation. I'm not sure I quite agree with that extreme, but remember who these people are and what their charge is. This is a task force of the U.S. government. It is a public health organization. They look at life not from the individual's perspective, but from the nation or the public as a whole. And so for their reference is, as a society, do we benefit more from PSA testing or not? They are not commenting about any individual patient who may or may not have benefited from PSA testing. What they're saying is, from a public health perspective, we have some issues here. It's a perspective people don't always understand. And that is the charge from this group by the U.S. government to evaluate not just PSA testing, but lots of screening programs and lots of public health measures to see if they make sense, to see if they should be funded by the U.S. government. That is their charge. And what did they do? They asked four questions. And let's look at these questions to see if they're unreasonable. They said, does PSA-based screening decrease prostate cancer specific or all-cause mortality? If you're instituting a screening test, I don't think that's an unreasonable question that they should ask. When you do that, what are the harms of a screening program? And when you screen, the only way screening can work is if you have a treatment that alters the outcome. Because if you find a disease and you can't treat it, it doesn't make any difference. So therefore, their third question is, what are the benefits of treatment of early stage screen detected prostate cancer. And like anything else in medicine, if you intervene, you occasionally cause harms. So what in fact are those harms? These are the four questions posed by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And if I put you in charge of a task force evaluating this, you would probably come up with something very similar to, at, to answer this question. So let's go through these four questions. Does in fact screen detection decrease prostate cancer or all-cause mortality. And unlike a lot of things in medicine, we actually have two randomized trials that have addressed this question. Is that your lake? That is my lake. He Thank owns you. an island. I own a lake. No, I don't own a lake. <laughs> <laughs> I just go out on it. His island is bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> the audience is digressing here for the folks that's out in Kamloops, etc. I apologize for them. <laughs> they might have to be taken out of the auditorium. Anyway, uh, what are these two trials? First one is a PLCO, and I won't dismiss it out of hand, but most of us agree it was underpowered. It involved 76,000 men. I actually sat on the cause of death committee, and that's why I want to focus a little bit on the deaths, because when you look at this trial, one of the things that you strikes you is that first top graph Screening, even in the PLCO system, and despite a lot of men having PSA testing and were contaminated, etc. Um, welcome, Elizabeth. Nice to hear you're here. Um, uh, screening, in fact, did result in an increased number of diagnoses of prostate cancer. So, despite all the warts associated with the PLCO trial, the screening arm did find more cancers. But despite this, the death rate of the two were relatively similar. In fact, identical. But what more importantly I want to look, have you look at is look at the total number of deaths out of almost 80,000 men after seven years. We're talking about 94 deaths from prostate cancer in total. From a public health perspective, that's a relatively rare disease. 
Urologists think everybody has prostate cancer because we live this life. But in fact, from a public health perspective, it's an enormous public health issue to try to prevent relatively modest number of deaths. Yes? Seven years is a incredibly unrealistic uh, time. Martin, I don't disagree with you, so therefore we're going to look at this next trial. Remember I told you there were two trials. The second trial is the ESRPC trial, which I think most people look at as the definitive trial to date on the screening question. And for those of you who read Lancet, uh, um, the 13-year up, uh, um, update occurred in August. I hope you've actually looked at it in, in, in Journal Club, because if not, we are going to look at it carefully. <clears throat> this is the money shot. Anyone who writes papers or knows, and I teach my residents at Journal Club, the right way to cor correctly to write a paper is you have one or two key concepts in a paper. You always present those one or two key concepts as a figure. If you have more than that, you're detracting from it. All the stuff that you don't want to have quite as displayed, you put in tables. So the message here is that figure, which shows a big gap. So it looks like screening makes a big difference. But when we look at the y-axis, you realize that's heavily truncated. It only goes from 0 to 0 0.010. And that delta translates into the 1 to 2 patients per 1,000 screened. But let's explore these numbers a little more carefully, because this is where you really understand what's going on. This is one of the tables from the most recent update, which is 13 years. And we can argue whether that is long enough or not. But we will get to that in the next slide, Martin. So hold your questions. Um, I want to focus on a couple of issues. Column 1 is the intervention group. Column 2 is the control group. If we look at the core ages, we have 15,000 men screened, excuse me, 15,000 deaths um, in the uh, uh, intervention group, 19,000 in the control group. This is all-cause mortality. If you look at the, is there a difference? The answer is no. But when you look at those numbers, you'll realize in order to detect a difference in all-cause mortality, the sample sizes would be, have to be so huge, you would never be able to do the study. <clears throat> so anyone who critiques these studies saying it didn't show a difference in all-cause mortality, you're right. But the study would be, have to be so big and basically um, uh, uh, cost so expensive, it would never be done. But it drives to the heart of the incidence of the disease we're looking at is still very modest. Yes? Remind me, Peter, was it men screened or invited? to screen? Uh, these are, big difference. I, it is a big difference, but actually they had a pretty good compliance rate. I don't have the exact details on that. But I believe this is the number of people who actually were in the study and is part of the data set. Okay? We go down in the next column, the number of deaths, prostate cancer mortality. You see them broken down by age range and you see them at the core age group. In the intervention group, the screen group, we still had 355 prostate cancer deaths. In the control group, we had 545. Actually, I should point this out here with the arrow. There we go. Again, in the core age, 355 deaths versus 545. So the delta, the difference, is 200 deaths. A couple of things. Number one, those number of deaths after 13 years, 355 out of 15,000 men screened is still a fairly modest number. Equally important, out of the 545 deaths in the control group, when you look at that in the screen group, more than half of the potential screenees still died of their disease. How do I come to that? In the core, in the core age group, in the control, 545. <laughs> If all the ones in the screen group had been cured of their disease, you'd have shed zero deaths in the other column. But in fact, we only lowered the death rate by a fairly modest amount. Equally important, I want to focus. Oops, back one. Oops. I want to focus on this young age group. The core age group started at age 55. This is why the AUA guidelines uh, committee, and I was on that with Val Carter. We focus the guidelines starting at 55, because that's where the data suggests that we have a difference. But I want to focus on this under 50 crowd. Notice you have six deaths in the intervention group, seven in the control group in the 50 to 50, or the under 55 crowd. 
had a really fairly modest follow-up. It's not like we didn't have anyone in, in that. You have 64,000 person years in that follow-up. And when we go over here to the last column, this is the rate ratio. This is the difference between this is the difference between the screening group and the control group. You can see that we had a modest difference from age 55 to 59. Essentially no difference, 60 to 64, very modest difference. Uh, both of those, you could argue, were underpowered, but everything is being driven by the 65 to 69-year group. This is where the biggest difference were noticed, the biggest p-value, and it's what's driving the outcome from the, all, uh, from the, the core age group. So again, <clears throat> we don't have uniformity between all the ages, which is puzzling. And, and ask, the, ask the question, why are these major differences between age groups when in fact we believe that screening and treatment should be occurring at, a, at an even pace throughout the ages, and in fact, as people get older, we should be protecting and saving more men. Uh, in the 70-year-old crowd, the numbers are too small. That's just the events? Yeah, these are the raw numbers. But, that's what I mean. they, but eventually, the events. correct, the number of events. right, and therefore you need each one of those age tranches are too small individually to have sufficient power. When you <coughs> throw them all together, you're gaining the statistical power. But it's important to know what's really driving that power is the 65 to 69-year-old crowd. It's not even across. You're, you're seeing uneven. If we did a forest plot on that, you'd see the lines scattered all over the place. This is the other one. This is the mortality at 13 years, because one of the, the comment I want to make about the 50-year-old, the AUA was heavily criticized for not starting screening at age 50. Number one, the data isn't there. But even two, when we had that data, it was even hinting at a difference one way versus the other. This is the other promise that you hear that we haven't followed this long enough. If we just follow this for 13, 15, 20 years, we will get to critically important numbers. Well, it's not happening. And that's why this appeared in Lancet and not in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that's my editorial comment, because it was odd that the first two publications appeared in New England Journal this third update didn't make it in. It must have been rejected. That's why I came into Lancet. This is my editorial guessing. But uh, when you look at the, oops, I'm in trouble with this. Um, when we look at the <coughs> trend line right here, this is the rate ratio. This is the kind of comparison of the screening versus controlled. And if you notice, the rate ratio didn't increase from years 1 to 11 when we went out to 13. It was 0.78 in years 1 to 11 and 0.79 in 1 to 13, indicating we weren't doing a better job as we followed it out. That was an expectation. That's what everybody expected to see at the 13-year follow-up. We're not seeing it. And what does a rate ratio mean? This is where the relative risk reduction comes from, which sounds like a huge number, 21%. It's basically 79, uh, 100. What often Fritz Schroeder quotes is this adjusted ratio of attendees. This is the Cusick adjusted, he often talks about. But most trialists would argue that's not quite how you do it. Uh, the usual standard is to do an intention to treat analysis, which every group you were assigned to, you're assigned and analyzed that way. Uh, this, uh, which, uh, quote, inflates the numbers, is when Fritz says, well, wait a second, what if everybody who was designed to be screened actually got screened and got their various treatments, and you, quote, unquote, do a, a correction, you can increase that to a potential outcome of, of sorry, uh, 0 0.71, which translates into a 29% relative risk reduction. The problem with the concept of relative risk, when you're dealing with small numbers, it sounds like a huge number when, in fact, the absolutes are quite small. And let me drive this home a little better. They didn't quote these in the 13-year, but this is out of the 11-year report in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you ask, ask, what type of cancer is the ERSPC finding, this is what you see. In the control arm, you found 6% men diagnosed with prostate cancer. In the screened arm, it was 9.6%. But when you break that down into the low-risk, intermediate, and high-risk cancers, you can see the vast majority of additional cancers being found by the ERSB study are low-grade cancers. But we're beginning to appreciate these aren't the cancers that are killing people, and these are not the cancers we want to find. When you look at the number of intermediate, especially high-grade cancers, 
the differences are virtually undetectable. And getting back to this 20% relative risk reduction, when looked in absolute terms, there it is. Which looks more impressive, that graph that looked like it was curving apart, or if I present it as a bar graph? This is the same exact data, just shown to you in a slightly different vehicle. That curve together looked like a huge difference. When I look at it as a bar graph, I kind of go, there's no difference here. That's the visual impact, but that's statistics, and that's what I talk about when I talk to my residents in journal club. How do you read this stuff, and how do you truly understand what's going on? If you go on the ASCO website, how is, this con how is these concepts uh, being presented? Well, this is the screening. The number of dots are the number of cancers you find if you go, if you are screened, the top bar. If you don't undergo screening, the incidence of prostate cancer is the lower one. So you can see PSA testing really finds more cancer, no doubt about it. But you look at the number of deaths, there's the difference as the way ASCO presents it, the number of deaths prevented. And you can see it gets down to that one to two boxes per thousand. That same graph I showed you. All different ways of displaying the same concepts. I'm just showing you a number of different techniques, but the way you look at it interprets how you interpret the data. But this is all the same, same stuff. Now, the other subtlety of the ERSBC trial, and if you look at the uh, USBC, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force report, they don't look at the, uh, the ERSPC trial as a single trial. They say, wait a second. The way it was conducted in Sweden was different from the way it was conducted in the Netherlands, which was different from the way it was conducted in Finland. First, on how they identified patients. In Finland, for example, it was a population-based role. They just basically divided the population. You're screened, you're not. Uh, there was, it was not a one-to-one -one ratio. In the Netherlands, you had to be invited to participate, and only after you agreed to participate were you randomized has different implications in the way a study like this will play out. In the Netherlands, they screened every four years. In Sweden, they screened every two years. So the PLC, excuse me, the ERSBC, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force say, well, the right way to analyze this is to analyze this as basically seven different trials, some of which are underpowered, some of which are overpowered, and that's what this forest plot shows you. And this is actually in the report. And if you look at the biggest contributor, is Finland. And Finland, for what I, I don't quite understand, and I've talked to Fritz Schroeder, and I've talked to Jonas Hüttiger, why aren't we seeing a difference? But in Finland, the one that contributed the most patients, you're not seeing a statistically different uh, yet. It could be it's underpowered because you get slight, it slightly favors screening. Spain contributed virtually nobody. Sweden and Italy didn't contribute very many patients. The Netherlands just squeaked positive at, at the 11th year and stayed positive at the 13th year. But the big driver is Sweden. The reason the ERSBC trial is a positive study is primarily due to the Swedish contribution. And if you know the history, the Swedes started their study actually before the ERSBC was organized, and Fritz Schroeder asked Jonas Hugesson to bring that study into the ERSBC, and that's how that evolved. And that is why um, they were able to publish independently. Uh, sorry, I went the wrong way here. So let's look at the Swedish trial, because they last published in Lancet a few years before. This got a lot of notoriety when it came out in 2010. Big gap, huge difference, at least visually shown that way. But when asked the same way, what were the Swedes finding? We're seeing the exact same story. Yeah, they found a few or higher grade uh, cancers in the screened arm compared to the control arm, but it was a more modest difference, 5 versus 5.7%. The vast numbers of the additional cancers were the low-grade cancers. And yes, they showed a, a bigger 50% relative risk reduction, 0.8 down to 0.4, just rounding things. But again, looked in absolute terms on a bar graph, it doesn't look quite as impressive as the curve with the two arms separating. Again, it's a perception, but unfortunately, the whole concept, whether you believe in PSA testing or not, does come down to perception because it's not absolutely no good and it's not absolutely wonderful. It's somewhere in the middle, and how you interpret where that middle is has a lot to do with what vision you see of this, whether you see the two graphs separating or whether you see the bar graph. In yes, Larry? All, in all fairness, though, it would look the same for breast cancer, for lung, for, for cholesterol. Uh, I mean, for all, 
but most of the, in, from a public health perspective, you're never going to see big, wide differences. I don't disagree, and that's why there's such controversy over mammography. There's controversy over lung cancer screening. There's controversy over a lot of these public health issues. Because it ultimately comes down to what's the cost of the testing versus what you're gaining. No, 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 we're not going to talk about actually. No, we're talking a little more on some of these issues because I want to focus on Sweden. Yes? to the number of countries in Europe and their differences in terms of the, the slide I just showing here? here? Yeah. Uh, is there evidence that the, um, there's a different contamination in the control groups between the different countries? Martin Glee is asking a question just for the audience out there. He's asking, was there a different rate of contamination in, uh, in the Swedish trial, excuse me, in the uh, European trials? Basically, the trials are relying heavily on the Swedish and the, the Netherlands, and I don't believe the contamination was huge. Um, it's not zero, and I know it was a little higher in some of the other studies. Uh, Finland contributed the most, and I don't know how much rogue screening was going on, but it's nowhere near what was going on in the U.S., nowhere near. I know Fritz spent a lot of time on this question. I think it was in the order of 10, 15 percent, but I'm, I'm guessing now. Uh, it's, 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 but it's nowhere near the contamination we saw in, in the U.S., and that's what he tried to correct for in some of his uh, uh, studies with Cusick. Just want to focus on Sweden. If you remember, the deaths from this disease are what drive, uh, in other words, the more common the, a, a disease is, the better a screening study is going to work if, there's, if there are a lot of false positives and false negatives. In Sweden, you have a death rate in the 65 to 75-year-old crowd that's virtually twice what it is in the U.S. and Canada. So therefore, a screening test will perform better in Sweden than it will in the U.S. for this point. Just again, if this is a graph of prostate cancer is by far the most commonly diagnosed male cancer. But it is not, oops, it is not the, uh, in the lower graph, it's not the common death except for in Sweden. If you notice, lung cancer is the biggest killer of men in terms of cancers. Yet in Sweden, where they smoke actually a modest amount, uh, prostate cancer is a bigger killer than lung cancer. So there's something funky about Sweden. And as I said, therefore, the performance of the test in Sweden cannot necessarily be generalized to this country, uh, a subtlety that most people don't appreciate. All right, what are the harms of PSA screening? I'm just going to run through what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is upset about, and most urologists dismiss, and I'm, I'm not sure uh, that they should have made a bigger deal, but they're saying that, number one, we've got a lot of testing that's going on that doesn't show any disease. So the testing, meaning the PSA elevation, is driving a lot of prostate biopsies. Um, they'll sell, you have a lot of false positives, a couple of men uh, get fevers, and what most of us are beginning to become a little more worried about is the number of hospitalizations from, from uh, asepsis. If you go on the ASPA website, this is the number of boxes that they say uh, men who are required to hospitalize for every thousand men screen. Well, the number is not that different from the number of people who are being saved from uh, prostate cancer mortality. And all you need to do is knock off a bunch of people from sepsis, and all of a sudden, from a public health point of view, you're beginning to say there are issues. But the other key point, and I think this is the one that urologists have to be sensitive to because it's an important one. If screening is going to work, you need to have a treatment that's effective. And what do we know about our treatments? Well, we have the PIVOT trial. And again, I'm going to quickly brush over that because I know it's, it, it's not, it can't be dismissed, but it is a smaller sample size. And yes, it involved older men than I think are being treated now. But these, these curves do give us pause saying intervention versus observation didn't lead to a dramatic difference in the death rate from prostate cancer. I think the more important study, and for those of you who haven't done it in Journal Club, was the update of the Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Group 4 study in March of 2014. This is now their 18-year follow-up. This is getting to be pretty good stuff. Um, as you know, they randomized just about 350 men uh, to observation versus radical prostatectomy. I agree, these were not screen detected cancers except for the last year or two of accrual. So about 90% were clinically identified. But it's still one of the few long term studies randomized that show the true efficacy of surgery as a treatment arm to treat this disease. And what did we find? These graphs tell us the story. 
there were basically two major messages coming out of the uh, SPCG4 study. It was number one, the biggest bang for the buck seemed to happen in the younger crowd, i.e. those under 65. Why that is, I haven't a clue. You would think surgery should work the same whether you find someone older or younger, but in fact it doesn't. Equally important was the concept of intermediate risk disease. If you look here, um, the column left uh, is your, is your um, uh, radical, prostatectomy excuse me, uh, radical prostatectomy crowd, and the column right is your watchful waiting crowd. You can see with low risk disease, you have relatively few deaths in either arm after 18 years of follow-up. Hence, the value of the intervention is modest because whether you had it or not, the differences aren't that big. On the flip side, the high-grade disease, whether you got the intervention or not, doesn't seem to make a difference on the death rate from prostate cancer. Bad cancer is bad cancer. So who are the biggest winners out of this? Well, it looks like the guys with the intermediate-grade disease, the Gleason 7s, and they're big winners in the SBCG4 study. They're big winners, especially the younger men with Gleason 7 disease. So anyone who says, no, PSA is worthless, what we do is nonsense, I would argue, no, the really big winners in this trial were the intermediate-grade tumors in men under 65. We have strong evidence to suggest that, can, uh, that prostate, uh, the, um, surgical intervention makes a difference. Again, uh, these are the tables in there just to focus down on the... Um, on the p-values, you can see with low, intermediate, high-risk disease, on the very bottom columns, you can see the p-values. The big one is for intermediate risk disease. You could say this study is underpowered, and to, I would argue to a certain extent you're correct. But as I told the residents last night, another major study will appear probably about this time next year. It's the results of the PROTECT trial being done in the UK, Freddie Hamdi study. He has enrolled, not proposing, he has enrolled over 500 men in three separate arms, surgery, radiation, and effectively watchful waiting uh, uh, conservative management. He has not proposed, he has followed them for 10 years. I know this because I go over every year, I'm part of their steering committee. They have done an incredible job in tracking. They have well over 98% follow-up after 10 years. I sit a chair of their cause of death committee. They have the, one of the most sophisticated ways of ascertaining cause of death. It is probably the best trial I've ever seen performed to address this question. It is now twice the power of the studies we have to date. So this trial will, in fact, address this question. In addition, there's another trial going on called the CAP study, which is a screening trial that has twice the power of the ERSPC trial. So well, well over a quarter of a million men are in this one. And again, this is not randomized by individuals, but randomized by trusts. Remember, in the UK, you get assigned to a primary care practice. That is your trust. that You get all your care through that primary care doctor. What they did was randomize some trusts to screen, others to not. Well, when they started this screening trial in the UK, uh, barely 4% of the men were being P uh, PSA tested. Even now, the rate is still under 10% to address the contamination issue that Martin, you're raising, because it's very real. Uh, this is going to come out and address in about one year. The downside of this CAP trial is it was a one-off screen. It was a single PSA test done once, and, and as a consequence, did you or did you not prevent, rather than repeated testing, which is current practice. I argued heavily that they should do annual PSA testing, but the funding agency had already spent an absolute fortune on this study. They said no way they can afford to do more. But all that's coming out next year, so stay tuned. Those will be important papers. Just quickly throw up to our radiation colleagues. They haven't done anywhere near as good a job. Uh, this is the SBCG7 trial results. This is involving radiation. This is, again, the Scandinavians who really do seem to pull it together when they have to do these trials. Uh, there's an Anders Vidmark study, where, which he took hormonal therapy versus hormonal therapy plus radiation uh, for men with uh, advanced disease. And this is the trial outcome showing what, in fact, we do have an, a positive impact from radiation, but it's not quite as clean a study as what is being done in, in the PROTECT trial. One of the harms, I don't think I need to dwell a lot. I think even the urologists would agree that uh, prostate cancer treatments cause harms. I put Marty Sanders' work up because I thought it was one of the uh, more classic articles that focuses on uh, prostatectomy, radiation, and brachytherapy, looking at the usual bowel function, sexual function, etc. 
uh, whether these are severe harms or not, are in the eye of the beholder. And you talk to many patients, they seem happy, though I've seen some pretty unhappy patients in my day. Uh, I've seen some fistulas, I've seen some strictures from brachytherapy that have, have men living with suprapubic tubes for the rest of their lives. Uh, these are not the kind of outcomes they signed up for when they, they embarked on their treatment strategies. So for every one hero out there, uh, there's also a problem. So when you put all this together, when we look at the four questions that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force asked as a committee, this is how they summarize their findings. Why not screen for prostate cancer? And they didn't say PSA testing doesn't work. They'll say screening may benefit a small number of men. And that's the concept. Is it small or not? They're saying from a public health standpoint, one to two people per thousand is small for the price that's being paid. Not necessarily in dollars, but in these outcomes. So let's walk through it. They say a small number of men may, may benefit a small number of men, but will result in harm to many others. It's this risk-benefit ratio they're concerned about. A person choosing to be screened should believe that the possibility of benefit is more important than the risk for harm. And the, the U.S. Preventative Services assesses as follows. They say, look, if you had 1,000 men aged 55 to 69 and you screen them every one to four years for 10 years, in the group that had no screening, you would expect to see five prostate cancer cases, five men dying of prostate cancer. In the screen group, you see four. So therefore, there's a net benefit of zero, one, and we might argue at 13 years, it's two. But everybody's in agreement. That's what you're, 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 you're accomplishing. There's no discussion on that point. Everyone's in agreement. Whether that's a lot or a little is where the debate surrounds. To get there, though, you have to biopsy 100 to 120 men, of which a certain percentage may or may not have complications that you may believe are important or not. And now those 120 men will agree that 1 or 2 percent, that's 1 to 2 men, will get sepsis bad enough to be hospitalized and potentially die. All right? That may or may not be important from your perspective. And that will result in 110 men being diagnosed with prostate cancer. OK? No one's really disagreeing on that point. Of which, if you treat all of them, two of them might develop a serious cardiovascular event. Three of them, or one of them, will have deep venous thrombosis. 29 will be, have erectile dysfunction. And 18 will have urinary incontinence. Sign me up. All right. From a pediatric urologist's perspective, this is a great deal. <laughs> Sorry, I could Andrew spoke out here, so I had to pick on him. But in essence, in essence, this is where the debate surrounds. So how you come down, is PSA testing good, is it not, has to do all about whether you think the relative benefits are as great as, as you think they are, or the harms are as great as they are. U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, I think, maybe has exaggerated the harm side a little bit, but I think the urologists exaggerate the benefit side. And that's why there is disagreement. So from the, and again, the other perspective that's different, the urologist frequently champions the individual patient. A U.S. Preventive Services or the Canadian Services Task Force champions the society, treats it as a public health problem, saying, wait a second, if we got X number of dollars, how should we spend those dollars? What should we be screening them for? Should we be putting stuff in to prevent Ebola or managing that? Should we be putting it in other preventers? Should we be vaccinating our children? In other words, we have X number of dollars to spend as a public health. Is this the wisest way to use those dollars? That's a completely different question than saying someone might benefit from an individual PSA test. In fact, when you talk to the individual patient and you say, OK, PSA testing, we can discuss it here, but..." We can't afford as a society to have somebody else pay for your PSA test. Would you be willing to pay for your PSA test? You'd be amazed how many people balk at that $15 or $20. Well, if you don't even want to put that much money on the table, why should society be required to put that much money on the table? Again, it comes down to how we spend our tax dollars. And in the US, we're not exactly tax friendly right now. And as we're running out of money to pay for our infrastructure and everything else, the question is, is this a wise use of dollars? The urologists think so but other people may or may not be in agreement. So I will end here by saying this is their final recommendation. Um, 
they say the balance of reduction in prostate cancer mortality 10 to 14 years after PSA screening is at most very small, even for men in the optimal range. The harms are such, and this is why they're giving it a grade D recommendation. Unfortunately, that grade D carries a little bit of a political punch, potentially, because under Obamacare, if we ever got to evidence-based medicine, we're not there yet. I don't even think we're close to being there yet. But in the big grand scheme of the people in Washington who are dreaming this stuff up, they believe that health care should be paid for when it has evidence-based and gets A and B ratings. Anything C or D, uh, some people are arguing, should not be paid for because we have no evidence that the intervention makes a difference. So this is a, this is a shot across the bow to all physicians, not just urologists, saying, wait a second, if you're going to start selling things to the public and you expect government to pay for it, the old days of saying it's so because I say it's so, is increasingly becoming difficult to support. Increasingly, the public is saying, all right, we believe you, but show me the data that this works. And when we can't show people the data, we're on very thin ice. Therefore, it's probably a very good thing that the UK government invested so much money in the PROTECT trial. I hope for urologists it's showing something. The danger is, is backing trials that, in fact, don't show a difference, because then we're even a bigger hole than what we started with. But this is the new era that's certainly coming to the US as we're struggling to figure out how to spend our resources. And I suspect because the Canadian Services Task Force came behind this, you and Canada are struggling with the exact same problems they certainly are in, in Europe. In fact, if you go to Fritz Schroeder's latest report on, in, in, in Lancet, the one I just told you that came out in August, even he writes in there that screening from a public health perspective is nowhere ready to be introduced in Europe. So even they're signing on to that concept. And I think I will open it to questions at that point. So if we have the lights up.